Please open your Bibles to Psalm 25, and I read this entire Psalm of David. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be ashamed. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. Those who deal treacherously without cause will be ashamed. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and your loving kindnesses, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your loving kindness, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in justice and he teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way he should choose. His soul will abide in prosperity, and his descendants will inherit the land. The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he will make them know his covenant. My eyes are continually toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Look upon my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Look upon my enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with violent hatred. Guard my soul and deliver me. Do not let me be ashamed, for I take refuge in you. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles." We pull ourselves away this morning from a study which we have been pursuing in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we find ourselves in the midst of the Psalter, the Old Testament Hebrews songbook and the song book of Jesus and the disciples and the early church. They would have known these passages and they would have reveled in them. They would have rejoiced in the great truths that are laid out for us here. Many of the Psalms have a superscription, that is a title over top of verse 1, that was not put there by perhaps the editor of your study Bible, but it says perhaps Psalm of David, or perhaps it has something further. This Psalm, verse chapter or, or Psalm 25, simply says a Psalm of David, and that is helpful to us. David's life lives large in our thoughts. We find here perhaps some hints of trouble that David went through that we read about in his account in Samuel and Kings. But those things come and go and we find it not perhaps as helpful as it might be. Some Psalms refer to David when he had gone into Bathsheba or when he had escaped certain troubles. This psalm seems to be of a more general account. You know 
a little bit of Greek and a little bit of Hebrew, whether you realize it or not. In the earlier service, we have three, two brothers and one sister, who know far, far more Greek than I or any of us will because they come from Greece. However, you know that the first letter of the Greek alphabet is Alpha, and the last letter is Omega. And you know that because we read in Revelation 22, Jesus is described as the first and the last, the beginning and the end, he is Alpha and Omega. You also know a little bit of Hebrew. We know that the Word of God stands so sure and we can be so confident in it that we read that not one jot or tittle shall pass away. That jot and that tittle, those were the little tiniest squiggles of the Hebrews' pen as they would sit down to use those characters. I tell you all of this because here, unknown to us as we look at our English translations, in, he in Psalm 25 we've got 22 verses which match the 22 characters of the Hebrew alphabet. Each verse begins with a successive letter, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, and so on, right down to the end. Now, some commentators say it doesn't matter a hill of beans what the letters are. That is just a poetical device that is used. I wonder about that. I wonder about that. I think, rather, that whether we are ABC or JL, JKL or RST or XYZ, that what is being impressed upon us is that our God, whether in earliest days, middle of the life, or latter days, whether our situation is very rudimentary and we're just at the outset of things or whether it's more complicated, that the God whom we serve is a God who is there through it all and that He is a God who is able to deal with whatever faces us and that there is no part of our lives which he is not concerned about. Those who are at the first and those who are at the very last and those who are lost in the middle, to everyone, our God is a God to whom we can cry and he will be found right there. He is indeed the Alpha and the Omega and he is in the midst of those things which concern us as well. We begin this psalm with the psalmist's position, the psalmist's perspective, and the psalmist's attitude. The psalmist, he says, I lift up, I trust, my confidence is in you, and I wait, I am looking for you. There is nothing more important in my schedule than that I might have a response from God Himself. Lord, to You I lift up my soul. He is saying, that which is the most precious part of me, I take and I offer it up to You. My very lifeblood, my very soul, that which shall dwell forever, I give the very best that I have to give. And my God, my trust is in You absolutely and completely. My prayer, my desire is that I might not be ashamed. And he speaks of enemies. We'll come back to those enemies 
He says that they were many. And he says, my heart's desire is that they would not exult over me. And he says, actually, my confidence is that no, none of those who wait for you will indeed be ashamed. They will be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. But those who wait for you, Lord, they most certainly shall not be shame-faced. Then the psalmist, he continues in verses 4, 5, 6, and 7, to make request of the Lord. Make me, teach me, lead me, remember me. The first one, make me or cause me, I especially want to dwell on that. How often, oh, let's be very honest, how often have you not sensed in your own heart that you, as I, have been more like a donkey than we have ever wanted to be? We have dug our heels in when God has wanted to lead us into a meadow of beautiful green grass and He has wanted to lead us beside the still waters whereby our thirst would be cared for. But the leading to, to get there goes through a valley that is dark and a valley where it seems that evil lurks on every hand and we, we fight. And the psalmist is saying, Lord, make me. I know that so often I am stiff-necked. I know that so often I fight and I rebel. I speak pious words and there are certain times when righteous sentiments come along and I sound good. But Lord, I need you sometimes to take me with a strong hand and make me. I am not willing at many times. Would you cause something to arise in me that I rebel against? Lord, again, my trust is in you. This Psalm 25 is nestled among psalms which speak of the resounding confidence that the psalmist has in the Lord. In Psalm 23, he says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He's the one who leads me, and he's the one who refreshes and restores my soul. Psalm 24, The earth is the Lord's, and all that it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. The riches of God. How great, how vast. Psalm 26 speaks of how that the psalmist has trusted in the Lord and that his loving kindness is always right there. In Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Well, here, the psalmist in Psalm 25, verse 4, Lord, make me, make me, cause me, even when I'm digging in because of your kindness, because I know, I know that you have my best interests in mind, truly, cause me to know your ways. And he says, teach me your paths. The psalmist comes in humility and he says, I'm just foolish, I'm ignorant, I need an instructor to teach me exactly the way in which I should go. And he says, lead me. Just as in Psalm 23, he said, you do lead me. Continue to do that very same thing. For you I wait 
all the day. Now the fourth request that David makes here is remember me. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and your loving kindnesses for they have been from of old. Memory can be a bit of a concerning thing regarding the Lord. There is nothing more wonderful than the memory of God that He remembers His promises and His covenant, but there is also nothing more horrifying than that God would remember everything we have done. Here the psalmist, he says, Lord, please, please, how I would wish I could forget about some things that have gone on in the past. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. But, Lord, would you focus in according to your loving kindness, according to your goodness, would you remember me? All of the good promises that you have made regarding me, don't, don't, Forget about those. The psalmist continues, verses 8 to 11, to speak of the character of God. Good and upright is the Lord. He is an instructor of sinners. And you need to be a gracious God. You need to be a gracious, compassionate instructor in order to work with sinners. God does not just say, look, you sinners, be gone. I will have nothing to do with you. I'm only, cons uh, I'm only concerned with the righteous. But the Lord is the one who takes sinners and cleanses them and works with them, and instructs those who have previously missed the road that they might find the way. The Lord is not only good and upright and one willing to graciously and patiently deal with sinners, He leads the humble in justice. And He teaches the humble His way. All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth. There is no lie in Him. To those who keep His covenant and His testimonies, for Your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. The psalmist comes humbly and lowly with contrition, and he says, Lord, I can't hide anything from you. Here it is right before me as it is right before you. And he asks for something of the Lord. He asks for pardon. Pardon. Now you don't ask someone for something that you know they will not do. There's no point in that. But David, he comes with a confidence in his heart that God is a good God, that He instructs sinners in the way. David, he lumps himself in there and he says, pardon, I pray. In verses 12 to 15, David speaks about the secret of the Lord and he talks about fear. Fear. In both the Psalms and then in Proverbs, written by Solomon mostly, the theme of the fear of the Lord is very prominent, just as we have in Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And Proverbs 9 and verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge and wisdom. They are separate, but they interact most definitely with each other. Knowledge, that which is the accumulation of facts and basic working tools. And wisdom, how to use that knowledge. But it all hinges 
It is all dependent upon the fear of the Lord. That is the vital ingredient. And David here, he says, who is the man who fears the Lord? Good is coming his way. God will instruct him in the way he should choose. His soul will abide in prosperity. And we must not think of that with dollar signs in our eyes, but think of it in true spiritual riches terms that will not fade or pass away. His descendants will inherit the land. And David says, the secret of the Lord. Here, you listen keenly here. The secret of the Lord is for those who fear Him. Some commentators and translators have replaced that word secret with friendship. Or they have replaced it with counsel. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear Him. Or the counsel of the Lord is for those who fear Him. I like all three. For Certainly, a friendship, who do you share intimate details with, but with a friend, someone who you can lean upon, you can count on, you can trust, that they're not going to be blabbing it all over the place. From whom do you receive good counsel, but from someone who is close at hand, a friend? And so, here, David, he says, the secret, the friendship, the counsel of the Lord, pressing in close to His side, being in an intimate relationship with Him, the secret of the Lord, or the secret place of the Lord, is for those who fear Him. Once again, that vital ingredient, so important, not to be dissuaded or, or derided. It is something that is precious. And God, we are, we are told here, He will make them, God will make them, those who fear Him, to know His covenant and all of His promises. His, my eyes are continually toward the Lord, for He will pluck my feet out of the net. Then finally, we have concluding requests which the psalmist makes. And he says, turn to me and be gracious to me. Here there is distress and there is trouble. David says that he is lonely and afflicted, that he is troubled, that he is distressed, that there is affliction and trouble. And he says once again that he is in need of forgiveness. And David, he says, Lord, don't just look at me and those things which weigh heavily upon me, but I want you to look at my enemies, first of all, that they are many, and I want you not just to look on the outward appearance at how many there are, but I want you to look in their heart and see what is in that heart there is a spite and it is a violent hatred that is directed at me and David he says Lord I want you to guard I want you to guard my soul and deliver David realized that he was not able to do what needed to be done he was not strong enough to hold his soul. And so he says, Lord, I have lifted up my soul to you. I want to have you guard it. Just like the Apostle Paul. I have committed unto him and I know that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day, the day when he shall when Christ shall appear. David, uh, David in similar manner, he says, Lord, I have something precious that you have given to me. 
You have given to me an eternal soul and I want to return that back to you. I lift it up to you, Lord, and I want you to guard it for I realize that I am weak. The old hymn says, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Lord, I want you to keep me. I want you to be the shepherd who never slumbers or sleeps. I want you to be the watchman who watches over me without any pause, without any potty breaks or any lunch or coffee breaks. I want you to be the one who is there ever watchful over me. Guard my soul. Deliver me, Lord. Do not let me be ashamed. I take refuge in the fortress that you are. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me. And again, just as before, as he said, Lord, I wait on you. Again, he says, Lord, all of this, I wait on you. You're the most important thing of all my calendar events. At the conclusion of Psalm 27 also, David gives the counsel and he presses the case. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes! Yes! Wait for the Lord. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for the privilege of looking to your word and of hearing from over 3,000 years back, the words of David, who describes himself as sorely pressed, afflicted, troubled, distressed. Lord, yet his confidence was in you. That as great as his enemies were, as many as there were, as violent as as great as the hatred was, yet you are surpassingly greater. Lord, we would bow before you and say, O oh God, you who watched over David, you who watched over the Apostle Paul, watch over and guard us as well. Strengthen us that we might walk in your ways and that we might be pleasing before you and work your will, accomplish your eternal plans in us. Cause us, cause us, O oh God, whenever we are stiff-necked, whenever we are hard-hearted, whenever we are thick-headed and can't see the way, Lord, help us and grant your mercy at those times as well we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.